Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Can you guys hear me well? Yes. Praise the Lord. I just want to start this morning thanking the Lord for His goodness and for His mercy. Because every single one of us that is here is a miracle that we are here. God knows that many of us are battling health issues and many of us are battling different situations that maybe are family related or maybe are uh, relationship related. Um, but it is by His grace that we are here. God wants to have an encounter with us this morning. It's His, it's his interest that we would come to Him and that we would listen to His voice. So with that in mind, let's just bow our heads one more time and ask God's blessing and His Word. Our Father in Heaven, we're just asking You at this very moment that You would come down and abide with us and be with us. Lord, as we study Your Word, we just want to invite You to be in this room and this place. That all distractions and all things that are keeping us away from You may cease that we may only focus on Jesus. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you know that from all the animals, the African impala can jump a height of 10 feet and cover a distance of 30 feet? Yet this magnificent creature can be kept in an enclosure in a zoo with it only a three-foot wall. And you ask, why is, how is this possible? How can the enclosure of our, for only three feet keep the impala from jumping? Because the animal will not jump if it cannot see where their feet will land. In our daily walk with Jesus, faith is the ability to trust what we cannot see. Faith is trusting in God's promises. Faith is moving forward even though we cannot see the miracle that liberates us from the enclosures that life sometimes entangles us. When we have faith, we continually are relying on Him and not relying on ourselves. In our walk with Jesus, even though we cannot see to the other side, even though we experience moments where we feel powerless, even though we feel hopeless, even though we feel there's nothing we can do to help our own situation, Jesus is calling us to believe. Jesus is calling us to have faith, not just any kind of faith, but unconditional faith. We have to believe and live a life that relies more on Him and less on ourselves, to live a life that wholeheartedly takes Him at His word, a life of unconditional faith. And you ask this morning, but pastor, what, what is a life of unconditional faith? It's simply complete dependence on Him. It's holding onto His hand as we step into the void, as we step into the unknown, the darkness, knowing that He's still there with me. It's moving in faith, knowing that whatever happens, He's still in control. Many times we have this mentality that if God really loved me, He would certainly do this for me. I wonder how many times that we thought that thought has flickered into our minds and we think and we look around and we look at our circumstances and we begin to wonder whether God loves us because if He really did, things would be very different. This is where faith comes into play. Faith comes into action precisely at those times where we are tempted to doubt God and His goodness. And we put those things into perspective. We're going to open God's Word and, so that we can talk more about this. And we're going to look at, the, at a story that appears in the Bible that's in John chapter 4. Many of us are familiar with John chapter 4 because of the story when Jesus was speaking to the Samaritan woman. But did you know that there's also an extraordinary story that comes after that story? 
Many times we overlook that story. Many times when we look at John chapter 4, we only look at the first part of John chapter 4, and we look at the Samaritan story. But we, our story really starts in verse 43. And this is the story when Jesus heals an officer's son. And verse 43 starts that after two days he left Galilee. Who is he in the story? Thank you. Verse 44. Now Jesus himself had pointed out that the prophet had no honor in his own country. And it's interesting to me, as we're going through this verse, verse 43 says that after two days, remember what we were talking about? Earlier in this chapter, Jesus was where? In Samaria. Now, John is pointing to us that Jesus now is where? In Cana. So Samaria, Samaria is down, and Cana is up north, northeast. So after two days, after the events recorded in Samaria, Jesus goes back to Cana, about eight miles further north of Nazareth. And verse 45 says that when he arrived, In Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. And they had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem in that Passover festival, for they had also been there. It's interesting to me that John uses this phrase that the Galileans welcomed him. Where was Jesus from? Although the reception seemed genuine, Jesus was not honored by it. Why do you think that Jesus was not honored by it? Because he knew their intentions. He knew their attitude. Beloved, we cannot hide from Jesus. He knows our hearts. He knows who we really are. If if we're coming to Jesus with false pretense, with false intentions, he really knows who we are. We can fool one another, but we cannot fool Jesus. And I wonder if sometimes we also have the same attitude as the Galileans. We approach Jesus, we come to Jesus, we welcome Jesus, we come to church, we volunteer, we give our time. But where is our heart? Where is our intention? Are we just Christians or are we continually growing in Christ? And having seen this, John says that that phrase really is just describing the incidents that had happened in Jerusalem that took place at the Passover. And what are the things that took place during that Passover in Jerusalem? Well, people were seeing signs and wonders. And it's interesting that John uses this phrase, signs and wonders, just to denote miracles. Whenever John uses signs and wonders, what he's really saying is miracles. So we have these people, these Jews, coming in, seeing Jesus with all the signs and wonders that he's performing. And therefore, after they see all these signs and wonders and they see all these miracles, what is the consequence of that? They believe. I wonder how many times we also have that same mindset. What happens to our faith when we don't see the miracles happening in our lives? Maybe it's very easy for us to believe once the miracles come afterwards. Anyone can believe. If we see the miracles, then I believe. But what happens to our faith when we don't see the miracles and I desperately, Jesus, I just need a miracle. I can't, this is not going to happen. What happens to our faith? Maybe our biggest problem is not, though, that we believe that God knows about it and He can fix it. We don't believe that He will resolve it, that He will resolve it in the way that we would like it. Because it's easy to believe when we see the signs and the wonders, when we see the miracles, but do we believe even though we don't see the signs and wonders? Even though God answers my prayer, but not in the way that I want. Verse 46 says that once more he visited Cana in Galilee where he had turned the water into wine and there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. It's interesting, when you look further into this royal official, this nobleman 
it, the, the word in the original language, literally it means it was a king's man. Scholars believe that he was probably a courier of Herod the Antipas. This noble man was a Jew, probably a Herodian. And a Herodian basically was a Jewish sect associated with the Pharisees in opposition uh, to Jesus. So they assumed to be supporters of Herod the Great. So imagine this scenario. Jesus and the noble man were in Cana and the son who was sick was in Capernaum. Capernaum, 16 miles northeast of Cana and mostly downhill on the shore of Galilee. And verse 47 says that when this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. So imagine, this is like a movie. You know, you see the first opening scene, he's sick. Now you see the act number two, and now John is giving us more an in-depth look. He's not just sick. He's, he says that he's close to death. And it speaks that when Jesus was there and all the people were around him, it's just speaking to Jesus' popularity. I wonder, what would you do if you were in his place? If your child, your son, your daughter was laying in a hospital bed right now and was dying? What would you do if your son and daughter was diagnosed with leukemia or a cancer? What would you do when you face great adversity? Oftentimes when we face great difficulties, the last to know about it is Jesus. Because we turn to other things. We try to control the narrative. We try to resolve the things our own way. We try to conceptualize it, to rationalize it in our own way. We want to have control. We want Jesus to answer our prayer, but we want Him to answer it in the way that we want it. What would it look like to have a living faith? What would it look like to have a faith that really trust in God's promises. We think as the noble man that we have fame, we have power, we have class, we have status, we have a high education. Don't you know where I graduated from? Popularity. That that somehow, some way is going to sway Jesus to answer and to some way come and answer our prayer. Do you think that that matters to Jesus? Does Jesus look at those things? But then we are utterly surprised when we realize that all those things can do nothing to help our situation. The Bible commentary in page 943 says that when, when it's talking about at this point of death, it says this, human wisdom and skill can do no more. And as a final resort, the father made a trip to Cana in the hope of pursuing Jesus. Don't you think that this millionaire had already gone to doctors? Don't you think that he already tried to do what he could do to get his son healed? It says here that as a last resort, he went pursuing Jesus to return immediately to him to Capernaum. And as the noble man, we too have that same attitude. We resort to Jesus and we come to, to Him only as our last resort. When we could easily come to Jesus, the first thing that something is wrong in our life, the first thing that something's not going well in our situation, just us fall into our knees and to pray. It's so easy. Instead of looking into different situations and different ways out. We just go straight to Jesus. Well, what's the problem? That many times Jesus is the last one to find out. Does he already know? Yes, he knows. Does he want us to come to him? Yes, he does. And it says that when this noble man came, he begged him 
What, it, what is John trying to emphasize to us in this story? That he had humility. That he had passionate urgency in his desperation. Even though he was a noble man, even though he was a king's man, he knew who was in front of him. When we approach Jesus, when we are desperate, when we have problems, we have situations, when we're going through grief, when we're going through pain, when we're going through circumstances, what is our posture? What is our attitude as we're facing and we're going towards Jesus? Are we approaching Jesus with an arrogant attitude? Are we going to Jesus with our pride? Don't you know who I am? Or are we going to Jesus in humbleness, in a posture of love? Understanding who we are standing in front of. What do we do when we are desperate? When we are facing calamity? Desire of Ages, page 197, says that finding Jesus, the noble man came and he found Jesus surrounded by a crowd. For you see that this noble man that had power, that had fame, that had money, he had arranged, the father had arranged a private interview with Jesus. But that didn't work. Jesus was already surrounded by people. And it says here in verse 48 that unless Jesus uttered these words, unless you see, he said, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. Those are harsh words coming from Jesus. Not just to them, but to us today as well. Verse verse 48, basically, remember what we said about signs and wonders? Jesus is basically talking about miracles. And, And Desire of Ages, page 198, goes deeper and it says that the Father had made his acceptance to Jesus as the Messiah on a condition. I believe in you, Jesus. Yeah, you can be my Messiah. That's fine. But I'm going to put a condition. What's the condition? On granting his request. How many times do we make promises to God? Are we faithful? Do we keep those promises? Oh, if you heal me. Oh, if you do this for me. I feel like our promises are like grains of... They're like, they're like ropes made out of a grain of sands. Because many times... They just fall out and we are not very truthful with our promises once those promises have taken place. So he said, I will accept you as the Messiah on the condition that you will grant me my request, thinking that Jesus would be more readily to comply to secure the noble man as a follower. Did you see the conception? Do you see the way in which human attitude to the depths that it goes to? If you grant me what I want, yes, okay, I will accept you as the Messiah. If, 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 if then you have me as, as I, if, if I'm following you, then I can be one of your followers. But Jesus detected his insincerity. It says here, the nobleman's manner of speech and bearing, and he realized that his faith wasn't perfect. I'm not saying that he didn't have faith. I'm saying that his faith wasn't perfect. Because he did have faith. You know, didn't, didn't he, after all, go and search for Jesus? That took faith for him to go all the way to Cana and to search for Jesus. But it wasn't that the nobleman had no faith. He already had a measure of faith, but it was not perfect Just as it was with the noble man of Galilee, Jesus requires us also to have unconditional faith before divine power can be exercised. The noble man's ideology stood on the premise that he would believe only if he could see. And just as Jesus required him to believe before he could see, he's inviting us to believe before we can see the miracles. Faith is that condition upon granting of certain requests that rest on a weak foundation. Because if our faith is resting based on us seeing the miracles and then believing, then our, finda- then our foundation is resting on a weak foundation. 
we will fail under the circumstances. When God sees the best, not to grant what is desired. Jesus delayed answering the officer's request because the noble man was not ready. What did I say? Why did Jesus deny or halted or delayed answering the officer's request? Because he was not ready to receive what he was asking for. In his present frame of mind, he did not qualify to receive anything from the Lord until he realized his utter need. Isn't that moment when we humble ourselves, when we are desperate and we realize, Oh Lord, I need you. I just need you. Many times we aren't ready to receive what God wants to give us. Because we haven't realized our utter need and dependence on Him. As missional citizens of the kingdom, Jesus is asking us to exercise unconditional faith. A faith that is not based on knowledge, because we can talk here this morning about faith. All that we want. But there's a difference between talking about faith and having a living faith. Many times our faith is conditioned to believe only when we receive. So when the storms come in our lives and we face various circumstances that are out of our control, we question the presence of God. And I just want to tell you this morning that even though you may seem that God is silent, even though it may seem that God is not there with you, God is still there with you, even though you cannot feel Him. It's not about feeling God. It's about believing. It's about knowing His promises. It's about His being faithful to us. It's about knowing that He is there with us even though when we cannot feel that He's there with us. When we say, where are you, Lord? I can't see you. I can't see any evidence that you're still there or that you even care. When we have those thoughts, when we feel as though God has surely deserted us, Those are the moments that God is calling us to have faith, to have unconditional faith, to have a living faith that is trusting God, not dependent on what we can see through human eyes, but to know that even though in the unknown, God is still there with me. Verse 49, before we go there, it says that in the story, we see that the purpose of the miracles was to produce faith. But the best faith is not based on miracles. And verse 49 says that the royal official said, Sir, come down before my my child dies. Why did he say that? Because he recognized that Jesus read his heart. It's not time to be playing around. He knew that his own motives had been selfish. He saw that his only hope of saving his child was surrendering his unbelief and false pride. How many of us, as the noble man, Jesus is also inviting us to surrender our unbelief, to surrender our false pride, to believe in him. And verse 40 says that Jesus just said, go, your son will live. Can you imagine when the officer's reaction when Jesus said, go? He was expecting for Jesus. He was going to be there with Jesus because he was wanting to sway him to go to Capernaum. And then Jesus just stands there and he says, just go. Your son will live. Can you imagine his reaction? In his mind, he's thinking, Jesus, come down to Capernaum. Heal my son. And Jesus just says, go. Many times we're waiting for Jesus to to put in us that healing touch when His Word is just as powerful. He does not need to touch us necessarily. If His Word is just as powerful as His touch, His Word can, can just heal it all. And Ellen White says that the noble man was required to depart without evidence that his request had been granted. His faith, was, his faith was put to the test. He had to act in faith, believing that he had received what he had come to ask for. And I love this, the last part of verse 50, where it says that he took Jesus at his word. Wow. Meaning that he had genuine faith. 
that he believed without seeing. How many of us here take Jesus at his word? We read the scriptures, we read the promises, but do we honestly, brutally believe in them? Pastor Rich Viotas from New York City says, we are called to believe by faith, not a faith center on our own ability to believe, but a faith center on the faithfulness of Jesus. Jesus has always been faithful to his promises. There's no need to doubt him because everything he said he would do, he has done. And therefore, he's not only believable, but he's also lovable. Jesus is such an amazing God. He designed you. He made you. He created you in such a way that no, no one else could do. And the reason that you're here, the, least, the reason that you're alive, the reason that you're still here, here breathing is because Jesus has a purpose for your life. Amen. Your story is not yet over. Yes. And the results of this miracle made the way for the entire family, for the city that Jesus would later, this miracle created a way for Jesus later on, six months later, to make Capernaum his home base for ministry. I ask, in our 21st century American individualistic, social, and cultural perspective. Why is faith necessary in my walk with Jesus? Why does it even matter what we read today that happened over 2,000 years ago? How does this story conceptualize with my life today? How do the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth resonate in a pragmatic way in my life? Maybe it looks something like this. Exercising faith instead of mistrust. Holding on to hope instead of fear, which leads to anxiety. Growing each day in my walk with Jesus. Studying His Word, praying, believing that God is in control even though I cannot feel Him or see Him because I'm trusting in His promises. I'm holding on to His hand, believing that He can see me through. In the terrible days of the bliss, a father holding his small son by the hand ran from the building that had been struck by a bomb. And in the front yard was a shell hole. Seeking shelter as quickly as possible, the father jumped into the hole. Seeking shelter as quickly as possible, he jumped into the hole and held up his arms for his son to follow. Terrified, Hearing the father's voice yelling for him to jump, the boy replied, I can't see you. I can't see you. The father, looking up against the sky, tinted red in the burning buildings, called to the silhouette by his son. And he said, jump, jump. But the boy said, I can't see you. The boy jumped because he's trusted his father. In the same way, Christian faith enables us to face life or meet death, not because we can see, but because we know that we are seen. Not because we know the answers, but that we are known. As we go through life facing grief, pain, rejection, depression, health issues, whatever that is for you this morning, fill in the blank. Anxiety, fear, disappointment, failure, stress. Jesus is inviting you to draw near, to believe in Him. I want to have that kind of faith. Do you? If that's your desire, I would like you to stand up as we sing hymn 526. Because He believes I can face tomorrow. Because my Jesus lives, all fear is gone. Because He lives is that He holds the future that makes life worth living for. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much because you are always faithful to us. Regardless of what we're going through, our trials, our temptations, our tribulations, you care so much for us. 
You're asking us this morning and inviting us to believe in you. Father, I remember Mark chapter 9, where it says that the Father asked you as you were here on earth, and he said, help my unbelief. Even if we have just a tiny little faith, Father, help it so that it can be enough. Lord, we love you, and we're surrendering our lives to you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.